Good morning, everybody. We're so happy that you are tuning in with us this morning. I just want to let you know right now what is happening this week at Woodstock Baptist. So to kick off this morning at 10.30 a.m., our kids church is going to be on Zoom. So if you and your family haven't received the link to our Zoom call via email, please send me a message as soon as you can, and I'll be sure to send that your way. And our life groups are resuming uh, back this week. So today, actually right now, the ladies class with Beth Dara and Mary Lee Gillis is happening, resuming for the new year. Um, so you can join in with them on Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. on Zoom. And Monday nights, our young adults are resuming, and uh, it's at 7 p.m. every Monday night. If you'd like to join us, just contact Pastor Nick for details on that. Wednesday morning, Corrine has a ladies small group here at the church in person, and it's at 9 a.m. And Pastor Craig is resuming his prayer gathering on Zoom on Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. And on Thursday mornings here in person, uh, Marg and Doug Arnold are resuming their small group at 10 a.m. here at the church. So if you'd like to be a part of one of our small groups, we encourage you to sign up. Pastor Nick is starting his again next Sunday on January 10th, and that is every Sunday morning at 8 a.m., either on Zoom or in person here at the church. And we also want to remind you about the annual reports. If you are on a committee here at the church and need to uh, write up your annual report, we just ask that you finish it up and send it our way, either via email or you can drop it off at the church sometime this week. We also want to remind you that we are back in person as long as we are still in the yellow phase uh, for church next Sunday starting January 10th. So we look forward to seeing you. You can come to our 9 a.m. service or our 11 a.m. service and our kids church is at 11 a.m. in person as well. And you can sign up online or give us a call and reserve your spot. So we look forward to seeing you and we hope that you enjoy the service. Well, good morning, everybody. Today's call to worship is found in Psalm 91, verses 1 through 2, and it says, Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Is God your fortress today? As we are finally in 2021, a year that didn't seem to go by, 2020 is now done, and we're starting a new year. And the question is, who is your refuge? Uh, it's a question I think we need to ask ourselves a lot this new year. And my prayer and hope this morning is that you say that God is your refuge in whom you trust. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we just prepare our hearts for worship this morning, guide our way, guide our hearts. Let us sing these songs of praise to you, Father, with a heart that just longs to be with you. Father, as we are just ending the Christmas season and just really getting started in the new year, we just ask for your guidance and um, as we take the first steps of the next year together as a church community and as individuals. And so, Father, as we worship today, help us see where you want us in our lives. Help us see... Uh, what you want us to do with this year and guide our way as we uh, worship you as a church community from this point on in Jesus name. Amen. Good morning and welcome uh, to our service this, for this morning. Well, welcome and happy new year and uh, we pray that uh, this year brings you uh, um, all the blessings that God can can bestow upon you. Uh, we're going to start out uh, as we have been before uh, with a Christmas carol. So will you join us wherever you are in singing What Child Is This? What child is this who laid to rest on Mary's lap is
that I'm going to be preaching on today is Matthew 25 verses uh, 14 through 30. It's a parable that Jesus tells and, and it teaches about the kingdom of God. And this is what it says. It says, again, it will be like, and he's referring to the kingdom of heaven. It'll be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold and to the other two bags and to the other one bag each according to his ability. And then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold uh, went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also uh, 
the one who with two bags of gold gained two bags. But the one who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. And after a long time, the master of those servants returned to the settled accounts with them. And the man who had received five bags of gold brought the, the, the other five and said, Master, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I've gained five more. In verse 21, it says, His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. And I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I've gained two more. And his master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share your, your, your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I'm afraid, I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. And see here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gathered where I have not scattered seed? Well then. You should have put my money on a, de in a on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back in interest. Verse 28, so take the bag uh, of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. For whoever uh, has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have even what they have will be taken from them and throw that worthless servant outside into darkness or there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's a big, big passage, a dense passage. Uh, so as we go into this morning, let us, let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we um, just open this word today, guide our steps, guide how we approach this. Open the hearts of those who need their hearts open to this message, Father, and speak through me today uh, as this is uh, a difficult passage. And Father, today as we approach the new year and and, and start uh, on uh, this 2021 journey, we just look for your guidance, God. And many of us today are experiencing great things, but some of us, Father, are experiencing sorrow and, and grief and, and hardship, Father. And as a community, we, we succeed together, but we also grieve together. And so, Father, we want to extend sympathy this morning to Tim and Krista Cook and the passing of Krista's father, Edward, Tuesday, December 22nd. And Father, um, we also know uh, there's many uh, at home who are struggling and, and, and with different forms of, of hardships, Father, and so we just ask that your healing hand might be on Shirley, uh, Eldon, Faye, Vaughn, Wayne, Audrey, and Libby. And God, as we approach the new year as a church community, we can focus greatly on what 2020 has brought us. But Father, we know you are faithful and faithful still. And help us learn today uh, how we can be good and faithful servants to you. And so God, as we approach today, uh, allow us just to see you in a new way, see our responsibilities in a new way. And let us start 2021. Uh, on the right foot and we ask all these things in your name. Amen. Well, good morning everybody. Today is uh, another sermon about faithfulness. Uh, this is this is something that I'm really kind of eager to learn about in this new year. I'm challenging myself to focus on one word a year and this year it is faithfulness. What it means to be it, to live it, and to recognize it when God is faithful in our own lives. With these sermons I hope to invite you into that challenge explore what it means for God to be faithful and for what it means for us to do the same. Last week, uh, we read uh, about David. In David's crown jewel of praise in Psalm 145, uh, we discovered a man who suffered and prospered much, David, also recognized and saw the power and consistency of God's faithfulness in his own life. And if we read that as for what it is, a beautiful poetic masterpiece, I think we can also see God's faithfulness in our own lives because God is unchanging. He is always faithful 
in the valleys or the hard times, God is faithful. In the mountaintops or great times, God is faithful. And so today I really wanted to focus on well, what now? What is our responsibility if we believe that God is faithful always? And sometimes it's harder to believe that, uh, depending on what situations we're in. But if we believe that God is faithful, what does that mean for us today? What does that mean for us to live? And to explore that question, I wanted to look at Matthew 25. And it's a parable from Jesus. And before we jump into uh, Matthew 25, I just want to highlight what parables are. Parables are a type of visual story Jesus used to teach his followers about himself, his mission, and the kingdom of God. They brought light and clarity to some people, uh, but they also brought mystery to others. They confused many. And even today, uh, some of the world's best biblical scholars uh, look at parables differently. They come to different conclusions because Jesus, uh, in the way he told them, bring again brings both clarity but also there's a vagueness there is a confusion that some people might experience but here's the thing Jesus is a master storyteller well the whole point of the parables is to get you thinking and to get you engaged Jesus didn't tell people uh, people parables to make everything perfectly clear uh, he told them to evoke and maybe even convict us okay when referring to Jesus' parables, I really like what Tim Mackey says. And he says that they're kind of like a storehouse full of treasures. Some are old, some are new, and some are waiting to be discovered. And my prayer this morning is that uh, we might discover uh, some treasures today with, with Jesus' parable in Matthew 25. Now, leading into Matthew 25, Jesus' disciples were asking him questions about the kingdom of God and when they should expect it to appear. And Jesus didn't really answer that question. And, and he, he instead told a bunch of parables. And one of these parables is found in verse 14. And to teach this morning, I'm going to break it up into different sections. So the first part is the introduction. And it's found in verse 14 through 18. It says, again, the kingdom of heaven will be like a man going on a journey who called the servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. And then he went on his journey, and the man who received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one who ha uh, with two bags of gold gained two more. But the, the man who received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. We have, uh, in the story, we're aware of the characters. Uh, we have one master, right? We have three servants, and we have three piles of gold. And in some, in some Bibles, uh, uh, describe these piles of gold as talents. So one talent, five talents, two talents. But in this, my translation, and maybe some of yours, it might say bags of gold. Now, the point isn't to know exactly how much these bags are worth, but what we should know is that they're almost an unreachable amount of wealth that, that the, the master is bestowing on his servants. And to kind of give you an idea, a talent is approximately, but not fully equal to 20 years of labor. And so for the first person, the first servant, the master gives basically a life, a lifetime of work, a lifetime of salary. And, and whoever this master is, uh, we, ha we know one thing for sure, is that he has much wealth and he puts a lot of trust into his servants as he's leaving his whole wealth behind uh, as he goes away for a time being. So one also the other thing is that what is dink the question is, what is distinguished between the amounts given? Like, what, what makes this person different than this person to get five or two or one bags of gold? And this passage answers that question for us. And it says uh, he, the, the, it's all because of the ability of the servants. It, he's, he, the, ser the master is given according to his ability or to the servant's ability. Uh. 
So as we read, the master left, some of his servants got to work, the first given five bags, put that money to work, it says, and he earned five more. He doubled the investment. And the second servant also doubled the amount of gold bags. And uh, we get to the third servant, and, and we kind of see this third person, and he says, But a man who received one bag went off and dug a hole in the ground and, and hid his master's money. Without reading any further, maybe some of us might be sympathetic to this third person. Maybe some of us handle our money the same way. They, they, we hide it in, under a mattress or, or do something similar. It's a lot of money. Remember, one bag of gold in this context is still quite a lot of money. It's, it's a small fortune. And so this last servant... Um, maybe some of us can be sympathetic to digs a hole and hides the master's money there. So we're kind of left on a cliffhanger. The, 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 the master goes for an undetermined period of time and then he comes back. And we get a picture of, of two faithful servants. Um, <clears throat> and we already know the success they, they acquired, but we have yet to see the master's response. In verse 19, we, we get it. And it says, After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The one who received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. Now, I want you to, to keep in mind the master's response. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. So the master thinks that this massive fortune is a few things. And I'll put in your charge many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. And the man with two bags of gold also came. And the master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. And see, I've gained two more. And his master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things, and I'll put in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. One thing to keep in mind uh, from this response to these faithful servants is that Jesus makes no distinction between the two servants regarding the degrees of faithfulness, even despite uh, the difference of money they were entrusted with. In other words, the master gives them the same response and invitation to come and share in the master's happiness. He's equally proud for the different measures of success, but the same amount of faithfulness. Okay. And if we end the story there, we kind of get this Disney end. The, you know, we ha happily ever after and everybody wins, but Jesus keeps going and we get the master's encounter with the one who he later calls as the wicked servant. And the man who had received one bag of gold uh, came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard, person, hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground and see here what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant, so you, so you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed? Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I return, I would have, not rec I would have received it back in the interest. So I take the bag of money from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. For whoever, ha uh, wh whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. And whoever does not have even when they will be taken from them uh, and throw that worthless, worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So this is kind of where we get the learning objective of this parable. It's not with the, well, it is with the two first servants, but it's more from the last one. Notice what this servant says straight up to his master. Uh, the last servant speaks up, and, uh, and from the get-go, he calls his master a hard man. And from the English language, we, we don't really get the full picture of what he's saying, but he's basically calling him a taskmaster. He's calling him a hard man, which also means strict, harsh, cruel, and merciless. And he goes on the point uh, 
and says, you know, you have harvested where you have not sown and gathered where you have not scattered seed. And, and scholars have interpreted this in two different ways. One way is that he gained his success without really trying. Uh, it's like success without toil. Uh, he, he benefited from someone else's work. But the servant could also be saying that his success isn't morally gained by taking the, the profits from someone else's hardship. And here we have to ask ourselves the question, is this servant right about his picture of his master? Up to this point, Jesus is really kind of describing a master that is not a hard man. He describes a master who delights in entrusting his servants with responsibility, who wants to share his success and invite them into his happiness. But for some reason, the servant had a terrible depiction of his master, and his actions reflected how he thought of him. He says, So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground, and see, here it is, what it belongs to you. And the master calls him lazy and wicked. And, and for, for a lot of us, that might bother us because maybe we sympathize with this servant. Maybe we recognize the pressure in this situation with having a lot of money and not wanting to lose it or risk it for the master. We see ourselves in that struggle. and Maybe we too uh, would be afraid to lose the master's gold. But how does the, the master respond? He says, well then, you know, you chose the worst thing ever to do. If you didn't want to do anything with the money, you could have put it in the bank and I could have made interest off it. And he continues, so take the bag of gold. He's talking to maybe his handler or someone else uh, in, in the room or around them saying, so take the, the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. For whoever... Uh, will be given more uh, and they will have abundance and whoever does not have even uh, what they have will be taken from them and they throw the worthless worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth all we know at this point is that uh, he has a story in mind about the master that is not uh, that does not bear any relationship with the reality of what's happening in this story and he, he knows uh, he is a hard-working person, but what he fails to see is that the master wants to share success and share the hard work. He wants to share success and joy with his people, with his servants. <clears throat> so what, what, what this third servant thinks about his master is really nothing. He doesn't like his master, and because of this, what he does with his money is nothing. He just digs a hole and buries it. The only thing the last servant earned was darkness and separation from the master, and it seemed that uh, that is what he wanted by his, by his actions. Here, we're trying to understand this parable, and we might be uncomfortable at this point, um, because we've seen some images that maybe we don't want for ourselves. And maybe we've seen some connections between our habits and this third servant. So we have to ask ourselves, what is, what is Jesus trying to communicate in this parable? And we have to remind ourselves that this is Jesus telling the parable in the context of uh, that he is talking to not only his followers, but he's also talking to highly religious people like the Pharisees and Sadducees. And, and people thought they knew everything about God. But uh, they seemed to not know enough to recognize that Jesus himself was the Son of God. Remember, this is Jesus talking. He, he, was, he was talking about his mission. And he was confronting God's people who squandered the gifts that God has already given them. So, you know, taking it back, a trip back into the Old Testament, you think of God's people out of Egypt and they misused every precious thing that God has bestowed on them from that point on, like deliverance, the promised land, the kingship, the temple, and even their relationship with God, they, they misused as, because that is the ultimate gift. And Jesus is talking against the leaders of those who oppose him but he is also talking to his followers. 
his new covenant people, he's teaching them that God will bestow similar gifts of relationship and promise to the new covenant people, his church. And the parable asks us to think what we're going to do with the gifts God gave us. Here we are in 2021. How does this parable impact us? How does it impact how we are faithful to God? And I have three questions to ask you to hopefully bring us to a place um, where we can be faithful. And it's, how do you see the master? How do you see God? Last week we talked about God being faithful uh, and that never changes. But do you see God in that way? Do you see God as a generous God who is stoked uh, when his people become who they are called to be, like in this story? Do you see God as not as hard, uh, not strict, harsh, cruel, or merciless, uh, but, but a loving and wants you to exceed kind of God? Do you have a picture of God like this, or do you resonate with the third servant? The, server, the, the third servant, in, in my eyes, would have the same views of God as some of the highly religious people of Jesus' time. Which shouldn't surprise us that Jesus in his ministry, whenever he describes the existence of people who refuse to open to who he is, uh, he would often use images to describe them like they're going to a fire uh, or into darkness. When we have the wrong image of God in our head, we isolate ourselves from God. You feel cut off, you uh, feel alone, you feel like you're in darkness. And although I'm, I'm assuming Jesus is talking about a future place of darkness and fire, uh, we have to be aware that our perceptions of the master, of our God, the Father, is important of how we are faithful to him. If, you, if you're struggling this morning, uh, and if you see God as not loving, I encourage you to read the book of John. See the love that pours out of those pages. And if we want to be faithful to God, we need to have the right picture in our heads about who he is and what his mission is. The second question I have is, how are you using the time we have? In this story, we see a master who leaves for an undetermined period of time and then comes back, right? And in a similar way, Jesus left us after he died and ascended, uh, and he promises a return in which uh, it will be a day of of everyone bowing down and singing, singing his praise. In this passage, I don't think Jesus wants us to try and decipher uh, kind of when the master returns. He wants us not to focus on weird end world speculations. But the point Jesus is trying to cultivate is that the awareness that every day, that every person we meet, that every com conversation we have is full of significance. There is a meaning and value in the time that we have now. Each day is a gift. It is significant. And a step to faithfulness is seeing the master in his true way, but it's also understanding the value of every second he gives us to do his will. Okay? So two things. How do you see the master and how are you using the time that he's given us? And the third, and I think one of the most important things, is how, are, how do you plan to use the gifts that he has given us? This is a story about a master who leaves his wealth behind for his servants to use. And God does a similar thing when Jesus leaves. God has given us all gifts, each different, but all have a part to play in the body of Christ. And I'm not sure uh, if this story is, is, is about financial gain at all. But the point I think Jesus is trying to make is that the gifts that God bestows on us, that leaves for us to use, are just as valuable, if not more valuable, than the five talent bags of gold. Right? Getting rich was never Jesus' focus, but it was helping the low, the needy, the sick. And if Jesus was not talking about a massive sum of money that he left behind, what, is, what kind of gifts did God give us? When Jesus ascended, he left us the Holy Spirit. More valuable than any earthly treasure. And in John 16, 7, he says, but very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. And the advocate is the Holy Spirit. 
But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he'll prove the world to be wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. Um, and maybe you're new to the relationship with God, and maybe you're new to how the, the Holy Spirit impacts us, but with the Holy Spirit, we have the fruit of the Spirit, which means uh, we have the fruit of love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And we gain this fruit by growing our relationship with God, right? Growing the fruit in our lives. But we're also aware that the Holy Spirit brings certain gifts. And it says in 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through uh, 6, that it says, uh, There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of workings, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. So we, 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 in this passage, we read about wisdom, knowledge, faith, healing, miraculous powers, and the list goes on. And it says in verse 11, all these are works, all, all, all these are the work of the one and the, uh, and the same spirit. And he distributes them to each person just as he determines. So the same thing in this passage, which talks about, uh, you know, this master leaves five, two, and one bags of gold. He does it to their ability. And in the same way, the, the master, God, the father, bestows gifts through the Holy Spirit uh, and, and, and however way he determines. But I want you to notice this one thing, okay? The gifts that we receive by God, earthly or spiritual, and especially through the Holy Spirit, they are priceless gifts, and the gifts he bestows on us are fully wasted there's no point to having them at all if we bury them. And what is the point of having a message of wisdom, knowledge, or faith when we don't share it with someone else? What if, in the, in the situation of this parable, if we had the gift of wisdom, and, and the gift of wisdom is for us to share a message of wisdom to someone who needs it, right? What is the point of having that message of wisdom if we are like the third servant and buries it in the ground? We need to be servants of God, faithful servants of God, who learn to use the gifts that God has given us. Not that it brings blessing to us, but it brings blessing to others. Because we have been giving something, we're asked by Christ to bless others, to love God and to love our neighbor. The wicked person does nothing with the gifts of the master. So I ask you, and I humbly pray for you that you do not bury the gifts that God has given you. In other words, with the right view of God and seeing the time we have as important and valuable, we are faithful to God by using our gifts that he has given us to bless others. For God says the one who is faithful of the little things brings greater privilege and responsibility, but, but, but poor faithfulness leads to losing even that one has. This new year in 2021, think through what God has given you. The time he has bestowed on us to enjoy and bless others. Think about his faithfulness. The master is faithful. He wants us to share in his success and he wants to bless us so that we can bless others. God has a massive plan for your life. God wants to bestow more and more on you and bless you with his love and peace and freedom. So I encourage us to look at this passage for what it is, the story that should maybe impact us, maybe think about our own lives. And let us look at 2021 as an opportunity to see it as a time to see the master for who he truly is. Let us see it as a time of, of significant time and value, that each day is significant and, and valuable to do God's will. And let us use the gifts that God has given us, not for our own gain, but for the gain of others and for God himself. That is the whole point. These gifts do nothing if we hoard it for ourselves. They do everything if we share them with the people around us. So let's do that in 2021. Let us love God and let us love our neighbors. Heavenly Father, as we close today's sermon, we just 
ask for your help. This is a big task. Sometimes we are scared to use the gifts that you've given us. Sometimes uh, we see the need for help, but we don't step up to the plate to help others. And God, allow us to be brave enough to do that this year. Allow us just to see where you're moving and help us move alongside you in 2021. Let us not be fearful as the third servant said he was, but let us be brave and um, faithful because you are a loving God who is there always for us and who is there to pick us up when we fall. And God, we just ask that we might be reminded of that every day. Let us be reminded of how each day is significant. Let's be reminded of the gifts that you've given us and let's be reminded each day that you are a faithful God who loves us and has done so, so much for us just to, just to get to know you and have a relationship with you. And so, Father, as we end today, allow us just to be faithful servants for you. Allow you to call on us. Good job, my good and faithful servants. We love you, God, and we ask all these things in your name. Amen. Oh, come, let us adore you. Oh, Well, Pastor Nick has just talked to us about how God is faithful. And one of the ways that we see God's faithfulness is in his great love for each and every one of us. His love never falters, it never fails. Um, his love remains constant. And there's nothing that you could ever do in your life to make him love you any more or any less than he already does. He loves you and he loves me with an absolutely perfect and faithful love. In John chapter 13 and verse 1, it was just before the Passover feast and Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he showed them the full extent of his love. I just love that uh, phrasing. He showed them the full extent of his love. And there's a certain amount of fascination with the writings of John because John was an intimate and very close friend of, of the Lord Jesus. He was known as the beloved disciple. And John knew Jesus well and his writings reflect it. They are full of personal remembrances, the, the kind you find when the author writes about someone he loves deeply. And it's so appropriate, therefore, that John begins uh, John chapter 13 and verse 1 with those words as you know it's the first event as it it leads up to the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ that John would choose those words he showed them the full extent of his love and if I were to ask you um, how uh, Jesus showed the full extent of his love you would say this morning that he showed the full extent of his love at the cross and uh, he didn't just tell them 
he showed them, he demonstrated his great love for them. And the prophets, they revealed God's love and they mirrored it as best they could. But Jesus showed them his love in person. And the Lord's Supper marks uh, the beginning of the full revealing of, of God's great love. And how does he reveal his love? He reveals it by being willing to go to the cross of Calvary in order to make payment and make payment for our sin and purchase our redemption. What does this reveal to us? It reveals to us that love is a sacrifice and Jesus very willingly sacrificed himself on our behalf. At the cross, uh, Jesus revealed the full extent of his love. And when he returns, we will rise to meet him. And the price of his victory over the grave was paid for us at Calvary. And for this reason, we remember the full extent of his love. And so as we come to the Lord's table this morning and we reflect on his uh, broken body and as we reflect on his shed blood, may our hearts this morning be filled with absolute adoration and praise and awe at such a great love. And this is the full extent of his love. He gave himself for us on the cross of Calvary. And so as we prepare our hearts this morning to partake of the bread and the cup, may each of us just take a moment and say in the quietness of our hearts, wherever we are this morning, uh, thank you, Lord, for uh, showing me, demonstrating your great love for me on the cross of Calvary. And uh, in Mark chapter 14 and verse 22, it says this, while they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. And then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. And so this morning, we would invite you to partake of the Lord's table with us. Uh, I trust that you have prepared some bread and cup. If not, you can hit pause and go grab that right now. And uh, I, I would ask and encourage us just to, to take a moment and pause and reflect on how God showed us his, his great love. And, uh, and then I'm going to lead us in prayer and then we'll, we'll partake together. Father, we thank you this morning for your great love. We're thankful that you showed us the full extent of your love. We're thankful that you humbled yourself and you willingly gave yourself for us on the cross of Calvary. And we're thankful for your broken body and your shed blood. And we're thankful for the wonderful redemption that we all um, can experience and enjoy uh, by receiving that free gift you gave us. And so, Lord, um, help us just to draw near to you and help us to be near your heart today. In Jesus' name, amen. And so it says, while they were eating, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it. This is my body, which is broken for you. Let us partake together. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Let us partake together. Father, we do say thank you today for your great sacrifice, for your faithful love that is unceasing and never wavers. We love you, and we're so thankful that you love us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for tuning in with us this morning. We we're so happy that you decided to join in with us in worship. We hope that you had a wonderful Christmas season. 2020 was a wild year, but God was doing some amazing things, and we are so excited to see what he has in store for us in 2021. 
So as we step into the new year, we hope that you are able to stay focused on Jesus and just be reminded of the amazing gift that we have in his birth and the salvation that he has brought to us. We hope you have a wonderful week.